Uh, today I want to talk about a, a topic I call the spectrum, which will make a lot more sense as we get into the talk. But it, it all starts with, uh, I believe, what is the root of our photographic endeavors. We're all photographers because we enjoy exploring the world. We go to fantastic places like Yosemite, for example, and we use our cameras to make something like this. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that uh, Ansel Adams taught us this methodology of producing our work. And, I, and I'll bet this kind of presentation, a beautiful print in a mat board, uh, is probably what most of you do, right? Raise your hand. You, you, OK, we've got lots of these in the closet, etc. Curiously enough, however, to me, <clears throat> is the fact that uh, this is such a tightly defined method of presentation. It didn't always used to be this way. You know, when, uh, uh, when Stieglitz was doing his photographs, we didn't use white mat board because it didn't exist back then. Edward Weston glued a lot of his images with rubber cement <coughs> to something he called illustration board. It, uh, this convention of putting work in uh, bevel white mat board uh, is a fairly recent convention, codified mostly during the mid parts of the of the 20th century by Ansel Adams and his contemporaries, etc. And, and when you think about it, it's it's a very restricted thing. Uh, have you noticed that it has to be white mat board? God help you if it's blue, right, or black, or anything other than white. It has to be bevel cut. Mat board. If it's straight cut mat board, you're an amateur. You know, um, you have to number your prints. If you don't number your prints, then you're also not a serious photographer. And so, lots of people number their work. You know, one of uh, 250, or whatever the case may be. And we all know that the reality is most of those never make it to print number three. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if you're um, interested in selling your work, it really helps if you're a famous dead guy, as I mentioned yesterday. Um, and if you're not a famous dead guy, um, you know, it's, it's tough to, to sell work out there, particularly if you vary from this. But the, but the real question is, uh, is this as uh, inflexible a methodology of presentation as it might appear to be? I can't remember the last time I saw <clears throat> a significant body of work that wasn't presented more or less in this method. By the way, did you, did you get a chance to look at the Memento digital picture frames downstairs? Yeah. Pre pretty spectacular, I have to admit. I, w I was impressed with them. But I did find it curious that they had a white <laughs> bevel <laughs> mat right. cut ar around them. I mean, that t tells you how codified things are. Um, and, and the real question is, why? And what else can we do? We do live in the age of other kinds of media. Uh, first and foremost, of course, is print media. Uh, here's, this is not an actual cover of lens work. I've just faked these up for the purpose of the presentation here. But you know, c commercially offset printed things like lens work or books. Uh, we have uh, iPad, tablets, telephones, uh, computers, etc. There's lots of ways that images can appear. Yesterday, if you were in the talk, I mentioned that one of the great inspirations I have is, is uh, Ansel Adams because he taught me the difference between the print and the image. And if we can affix that in our mind, that the image is one thing and the print is an implementation of the image, then it gives us the freedom to think that the image can be implemented in other media. And once you start down that path, it becomes a very interesting, not only intellectual exercise, but I think an actual uh, exercise in productivity in how we think about our work. And it's what I call the spectrum. So in order to introduce this, let me sort of run you through a very quick abbreviated uh, simplified history of photography, just, just so we can set some groundworks. It started, of course, in 
uh, the early parts of oh, 1830, 1840, around in there, when we photographers, I wasn't around then, uh, but photographers made prints using metal salts and uh, daguerreotypes, tintypes, and all those kinds of media were what we did at that point. And that was all we could do, was those kinds of prints. There basically wasn't the ability to put ink on paper like we have now. There, there clearly wasn't uh, digital technologies or any of that kind of stuff. Fast forward, of course, uh, to uh, Alfred Stieglitz, uh, producing the great um, magazine called Camera Work. I'm sure some of you are familiar with Camera Work magazine and its history, place in the history of photography. Interestingly enough, uh, how many of you know that Alfred Stieglitz came from a family of German printers? And so he had printing, commercial printing in his background, and he knew the process known as photogravure, which is putting ink on paper so that you can make essentially a continuous tone image. He produced camera work using that technique, and it's, it's a spectacular technique. We can still do it today. Uh, it's a very, very painstaking way to make a photograph, but it can be done. Also interesting to me that when Stieglitz uh, closed down camera work, at least according to the records that I saw, he had exactly nine subscribers. So it sort of tells you how expensive this, this product was. It, was. it was a real collectability. Then, then along comes Edward Weston. Let's jump to his generation of photographers. <clears throat> how did Edward Weston make photographs? Well, he could make uh, a new thing. He was one of the first generations to be able to make gelatin and silver photographs, and he did. Most of his work was, was done in gelatin and silver. A lot of us have done gelatin and silver, I assume. How many gelatin and silver printers? Yeah, good. Uh, fabulous technique, beautiful images, etc. But Edward Weston could also reproduce his images in a technique called offset lithography. Offset lithography is what you and I might consider commercial printing, the kind of things that we see that newspapers and magazines do. Curiously enough, that technology came about about the same time that Alfred Stieglitz started, uh, photo, uh, started uh, camera work and was doing photogravures, which is part of the reason that photogravure ended up becoming one of the lost techniques of history that very few people do now, although it can be done. But Edward Weston could do uh, printing in gelatin silver and then offset lithography using what's called halftone printing. I won't get into all those details. But the, there was a huge, a huge difference in quality between his original prints and the books of his work. Some of you maybe have collected some of his early books. They looked... Um, not nearly as good as today's uh, black and white photographs in the New York Times. The printing back then was very, very primitive. Um, so photographers uh, thought that their gel and silver prints are their original uh, artwork, if you will, and the offset printing was some sort of inferior reproduction. But let's leap ahead in our little quick history of photography to the Ansel Adams generation. He's just a, just a little younger than, than uh, Edward Weston, and he also used gelatin silver as his primary means for producing images. Notice, however, that both Ansel Adams and Edward Weston could, if they wanted to, go backwards. That is to say, they could have produced photogravures if they wanted to. They could have produced daguerreotypes if they wanted to. Some photographers did in those days. But, uh, but each generation in its turn tends to really jump on the new technologies. <clears throat> this is going to be really interesting for us because, of course, we live in the age of evolving technologies like have never been seen in photography. But there's a, there was a really important difference that took place in the history of photography with Ansel Adams. And that is, uh, had nothing to do with Ansel Adams, but had to do with his good friend, uh, David Gardner. Do any of you recognize the name David Gardner? Anybody? Yeah, he's a very unusual individual. It probably has more to do with the history of photography than, 
maybe even Ansel Adams in some regards, but he's almost virtually unknown. <clears throat> David Gardner was Ansel Adams' printer, and David single-handedly invented a technique known as duotones that use, uses two inks on a commercial offset press, one on top of another, to make deeper, richer blacks, smoother gradations, and very photographic-like reproductions. And Ansel Adams took advantage of that. And a lot of his books that are so beautiful and that probably exist in a lot of your collections are printed in duotone because it's so photographic in nature. And it was a huge revolution. It took place in the early 70s. Uh, we print lens work in duotone using that same technique today, but uh, most magazines don't. Of course, now we have digital media, which originally used to have to be distributed physically on a disc uh, or on some other media that got sent in the mail with a stamp. <laughs> Uh, now it comes to us from the cloud. So th that's a real quick history of photography that leads us to, as, as a preliminary, to some really interesting questions. What's next is the first question. We don't know, but, uh, and there's no way for us to know, but isn't it reasonably safe to assume that something will come along the lines, that the history of photography has taught us that the medium itself is in constant flux. That'll be important for me uh, to make my main point here in a few minutes. One of the things that some people are starting to explore, not all of us, not every one of you in this room, but are starting to think about audio and video and interactive sorts of things whether they're PDFs or iPad apps, this is a long, long way from the beveled white mat board and the tradition that we have used uh, for many, many years to produce our work. In terms of original work rather than reproduction, this same scale plays out from metal salts to ink on paper to a different kind of metal salt on paper rather than on metal to pixels, and who knows what's going to be next. The reason I lay out all of this detail is because it gives us an opportunity to think in some very creative ways. This slide is the one I call the eye test chart. <laughs> and we can pass these out now so that everybody can have one of these to take home. Here is <clears throat> essentially the idea behind this talk is this. What if we started thinking about all the possible media that we have as photographers at our disposal? I would be willing to bet that most of you in this room are either doing today with your photographs one of three things. You're probably making either gelatin silver prints or you're making digital prints or you're posting them on a website as digital media, right? Does that, does that cover just about everybody in one form or another? But look at the spectrum of possibilities that exist for us. So what this chart is, this rather detailed thing that you can take home and study later. We're not going to go through it item by item here, obviously. Um, this is essentially a thought experiment, if you will, on how we relate our images to various medium and what various medium can do. So for example, just to point out how this works, over here on the left is traditional media photographs, wet darkroom kinds of things. Then we have ink as original artwork in this group, ink on paper as reproductions, as publications, as books and magazines and that kind of stuff. And then electronic digital publications over here. So it goes from from historic media to latest media. That's, that's number one across the top. Down this side are a series of questions. That's where the thought experiment came in my way of thinking. When I first started thinking about this in the early days of the digital era, I started asking myself questions like uh, durability. What is the durability of various media? So for example, just to show you how this works, 
the durability of an individual photograph is somewhat moderate because it's somewhat fragile. That's part of the reason we put them in mat board, right? Is to protect the individual gelatin silver or platinum palladium print, to protect it from the environment, from, from people handling it, etc. So the durability is moderate. If we put it in a portfolio, and by that I mean, you know, a clamshell box with uh, uh, individual uh, matted prints in the clamshell box, then all of a sudden our durability becomes quite high because it's more protected and et cetera. In an artist book, it's moderate again because books can fall apart, et cetera. Work your way all the way over to the far right hand side where we have things like internet web pages and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. And the durability is ephemeral. It, it doesn't actually exist. There's no molecules anywhere. It's just electrons on a screen. So you can see the nature of this uh, uh, thought experiment was trying to think about the characteristics of various media and how it might affect what we produce, why we produce, and how we think about it. There are um, all kinds of interesting implications as a result of this train of thought. And, um, well, the first of which is there's more than one medium that's possible to us. So I'm going to flip back to this chart time and time again, so uh, uh, forgive me for flipping forward and backwards. But, for example, let's say I have a, uh, a project that I've been working on. I've been photographing this thing somewhere. And now I have a bunch of photographs of that thing that's captivated me, that I just love photographing. The first question is, which medium do I produce it in? Well, in the old days, the medium that we used to produce it in was basically defined by how we saw ourselves as a photographer. In my early days of photography, there was no question about which medium I was going to produce a project in because it was going to be gel and silver because that's what I did. I was a gel and silver photographer. So it never occurred to me to ask the question, uh, what other media could I use? Until I started thinking about this chart and putting this whole thing together. And then I realized that's the first question. With any given project, which medium is the appropriate one? Some projects, maybe it's gel and silver. Some projects might be platinum palladium. Some projects might be an iPad app. Some projects might be this or that or the other thing. Do you see the immediate challenge that gives us old gel and silver printers? <laughs> Is suddenly we have to learn a new technology if we want to reach out with a new medium. You know, I, I don't know about you guys, but when I learned the zone system and I knew how to make a reasonably good gel and silver print, I, I thought I was kind of done with the learning curve. <laughs> and, and then along came digital photography. And, uh, you know, I had to start all over again. Each one of these represent a little bit different learning curve, which you may or may not want to engage. But if you do engage them, it opens up the possibility of asking yourself the question, which medium is the right medium for this project? Let me give you an example of how that expands geometrically, though. I had a project that I was doing that eventually uh, became uh, The Made of Steel, uh, which is a book and etc. It started off being gelatin and silver prints. And it was a fascinating story that, that I had no idea was going to be almost the definitive story of my photographic life. I, I, my grandfather, uh, who came through Ellis Island from Armenia and uh, brought with him virtually nothing, uh, ended up being a machine shop guy. And so I grew up as a youngster visiting my grandfather, and I learned to love machine shop guys and grease and the smell of tools and all that kind of stuff. So eventually I turned my camera to that kind of thing, and I started photographing drills and whatever the case may be. 
And uh, I, I started taking these prints with me to my local photo group. And I would hold up, you know, uh, drills or pliers or whatever. And the first thing is everybody would say, well, why have you toned them brown? Do you want them to be, you want us to think that they're old prints or something? I said, no, I, I, just, I just like them brown toned. And then they said, but why are you taking pictures of pliers? Because who's going to hang that above the fireplace? And I was young and naive, and I thought, oh, lots of people want these. They'll sell like hotcakes, <laughs> which, of course, was silly because they didn't. Um, and, and, but, but the point is, people couldn't connect with them at all. And one guy said, well, why are you photographing these things? And so I, I ended up telling a little story about one of the guys that I had photographed and his tools and his whatnot. And all of a sudden, people's uh, faces lit up. They could relate to the story. It encouraged me to think about including the stories. Well, by sheer coincidence, by sheer coincidence, I had a gallery that had opened up, up the Columbia River a ways from Portland, where I lived. Um, and they knew that I had been in the area photographing some of the old garages and machine shops and farmers and et cetera. And the people in this new art center said, how, how are we going to get the farmers and the people who work in our community to come to our art center? And they thought, ah, we'll have Brooks do the opening show because he's got all these garages and machine shops and some of the people want, want to come see their neighbors. And so they invited me to do a show. And I said, sure, I'd love to do a show. And I mounted all the pictures with gelatin silver print. And down below, uh, by the way, in white matte board with a bevel cut, <laughs> down below another bevel cut, four ply, with a little bit of text on the bottom that was a quote of something they had said or an observation I had made of them, little tiny bit of text, the story that had brought my photo group to life. And I thought, hmm, I'll, I'll put this you know, with the artwork and I'll hang that up. The opening came. People came, all the farmers came, et cetera, and they showed up you know, with their uh, overalls on, no, no black dresses, no white wine and cheese, no shrimp dip. I mean, these were farmers. They showed up and they were having a ball. They'd be laughing themselves silly over this stuff. And from way over here in the corner, I'd hear somebody say, Marge, you got to come see this one. You know, where, what Bill said is just hilarious. And my friends are poking me and saying, can you believe how raucous these folks are? And I said, yeah, I love it. This is great. You know, I've been to lots of gallery openings, and everybody kind of wanders around. And, you know, I love the fact that these people were relating to this. At the end of the show, someone came up to me and said, um, gee, this is really terrific. And uh, you've got a picture of Bill back there, and I'd like to buy that picture of Bill and give it to him. Now, keep in mind, this is a guy in overalls with a farm hat on, and I'm supposed to tell him what the price of my artwork is. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I was not anticipating this. And I thought, well, you know, how do I respond to this? Because I, I know if I tell him a sort of uh, unknown artist gallery price, whatever that might be, 350 bucks or something like that, he's going to laugh himself silly because there's no way he's going to pay me 350 bucks for a picture of Bill, <laughs> right? But on the other hand, you know, I, I didn't necessarily want to uh, say, well, I'll, you know, I'll sell it to you for five bucks. But I knew there was a pretty high chance if I said five bucks, he was still going to laugh at me because it's just a picture of Bill. So I begged off and said, well, they're, they're not for sale and chickened out. And he said, well, do you have a book? See, now he's talking, he's jumped media, hasn't he? He's jumped media and he says, do you have a book? And I said, no, I don't, I don't have a book. And he says, well, that's too bad. And he left and that, that was the end of it. But I thought after the exhibition, you know, uh, I really need to think about getting a book. So I grabbed all my prints the next week and my copy of Ansel Adams' Yosemite Range of Light. So you know that book? Fabulous book. Beautiful, big book. Printed in 300 line screen, 
uh, tritone, exquisitely printed. They look almost as good as Ansel's originals. I wanted my work to look that good. So I took the book and my stack of prints, and I went into the local printer, and I said, I want to make a book of this stack of prints, and I want it to look this good. And I should have known something when they started to drool. <laughs> and the guy said, I'll get back to you with a quote. And he did, and it was you know, $100,000 or whatever it was. And I said, clearly, I'm not going to do a book. And it, it taught me that you know, books are, are something, but they're a commercial commodity. As a medium, uh, they're, uh, they're different. They're, uh, we have to think of them differently because they're not artwork. And when they're a commercial commodity, a whole bunch of different rules come to play. So I started rethinking. And I thought, OK, well, if I'm willing to jump media from gelatin silver prints to a book, maybe I can jump media to a different kind of thing. That's when I started putting this together. The question is, what other media are there? Well, the obvious media was gelatin silver. But, uh, but I couldn't make you know, a book of gelatin silver prints, because it would be really difficult to do. But I thought, well, maybe I can figure out some way to do it. So I signed up, and I took a class on handmade artist book making and, uh, at the Oregon School of Arts and Crafts. And a woman there, a very talented woman, uh, said, well, we, we can figure out maybe how to do that. She said, can you figure out how to make the gelatin silver prints lay perfectly flat, perfectly flat? Now, isn't that an innocent sounding question? <laughs> <laughs> and I experimented, and I tried, and I, I did everything you can possibly imagine until I finally figured out how to do it. And the way you do it is you take your gelatin silver prints. No one cares about this now because nobody does gelatin silver prints. But here's how you do it. You put them in a dry mount press. You flatten them. You take them out while they're hot. You put them in interleaved prints with dry mount paper. And you put about 80 pounds of steel weights on top of them. And you leave it there for about two weeks. And when you take them out, they're as flat as a piece of notebook paper and stay that way. Well, it took me six months to figure that out. And, uh, and at the end of the time, you know, we had been experimenting how to bind gelatin silver photographs into a book, because I thought I could make at least a you know, small number of books that way. So my, my attempt to cross media was complicated, and I had to learn new skills, which we had to do every time we cross media. But I thought it might be solvable. What I failed to recognize was how difficult it was going to be to bind individual sheets of paper together like that. And you can't fold gelatin silver paper. Have you ever tried to fold it? It cracks because of the surface. So a book was out. But I had learned a very interesting principle in business. And that principle is if you find yourself up against a recalcitrant problem that is simply not solvable, what you have to do is figure out where the sticking point is, where the friction is that's preventing you from moving forward, and then see what happens if you just get rid of that. The sticking point for, for books was binding gelatin silver prints. So I thought, what happens if I just get rid of binding? Now I have just a loose pile of prints. But if I put them together with, a, with an art paper cover that folded with flaps, and maybe had some embossing and et cetera. I could do something. And that's what this is. It's called a folio. And so I sort of had to invent a medium for the work that I wanted to do uh, that was still gelatin silver. That's how I was making the images, but I was putting them together. I could put 10, 15, 20 images together. I could put in a text signature that had uh, some introductory story. I, I figured out a way to print text on every print. So it gave me the first alternative medium. Eventually, uh, the, the project became popular enough, and I had had enough distribution, that I was able to afford to produce a small, humble, little 
um, paper printed book, duotone, high quality printing, not a big hardbound book, not a coffee table book, but I was able to produce a book. And from that came eventually a PDF, which is, which is I think, a really interesting first lesson. Not only do we have the choice of what medium we want to put our images into, but we have the choice of using more than one medium. So let me flip back to my chart here. With any given project that you are developing right now, whatever that project is, you have two questions. Not only which medium makes sense for your project, but I might pluralize that. Which media make sense for your project? That opened up another interesting train of thought, which was with each new media, there is a new audience. Particularly, think about the impact of the iPad and, and uh, to some degree, the iPhone in terms of our ability to distribute our images. How many of you are involved in digital media, Instagram, photo, yeah, bunches of you. Think of the audience that has opened up to you. Do those people who see your work that way, do they come to your work when it's exhibited in a gallery? Or because it's digital media, are they far flung out in the world? You have no idea where they are. They could be in another country. They could be across the ocean. But yet they still have access. Different media mean different audiences. So when you have a project, let me go back to this slide. When you have a project that has multiple media, you've not only chosen different ways to produce the product, but you've chosen to produce it for different audiences. The people who see my original prints in a gallery are defined by geography and by time. They surround a city during a 30-day or 60-day time frame that my exhibition is taking place. The folio is kind of an original artwork. It's paper, it's molecules, it has to be sold because I have to fund it somehow. So it has a much smaller audience, but it's a more intimate experience of hand-holding that paper and seeing it. So that's a different audience than the, the gallery exhibition is. And I ship folios all over the world. But not tons of them because people have to buy them. And that you know slows down the distribution. Book is the same thing, although it's more affordable, so it's less money, so there's more books than folios. The PDF, which is the digital version, goes everywhere, goes like crazy. So you can see there's all kinds of implications. I used to define myself once upon a time as a gelatin silver printer. That's what I did. I, I, was a, I was a photographer who printed gelatin silver prints. Every once in a while I'd do a Polaroid, but I felt guilty about it. <laughs> now I perceive myself not as a gelatin silver photographer because I don't define myself by any given medium. Does that make sense? Once you start thinking about different medium and different audience, other implications crop up, one of which is that you may have more than one edition of a project. Think, uh, let me put it to you this way. How many prints do you need to have up on the gallery wall in order to have a successful exhibition? You, know, you can't have one, it's not an exhibition, right? But you also can't have 500 because then it's overwhelming, unless you're Irving Penn, by the way. <laughs> I, just got, I saw his show at the Met the other day. It was overwhelming, huge number of prints. Um, there's, there's kind of a right number of prints for an exhibition. Well, how many do you want to have in a folio of original prints, little inkjet printed things? About plus or minus 15 makes sense. That's a little thin for an exhibition. It's a lot thin for a book, isn't it? So a book might have 80 to 120 images in it. And a PDF, 
you know, there's no page count limitations. You can have as many as you want, which means that any given project that you do may have different uh, numbers of prints, maybe different amounts of text. Now, all of a sudden, do you see how that opens up all kinds of possibilities? Now, before I go any farther, however, let me go back to the chart. Think about this with the chart. <clears throat> You have a project, and you want to bring it to completion. And the first thing you have to do is decide what media. And maybe that's, for you, that's like it was with me, mostly one media, mostly gelatin server, or mostly, probably for a lot of you, uh, digital inkjet printing, or mostly Instagram. So you have one medium that kind of dominates. But you decide to do uh, more than one medium, which means different editions, et cetera. Um, to some degree, the number of different versions that you make might be determined by how committed you are to the project. Does this make sense? Sometimes I'm out with my camera in the world, and here's a fun little thing that I want to photograph, and I spend an hour photographing it, and I'd like to do something with those images. I don't want them just to die on my hard drive and be never, ever seen. I'd like to finish them somehow. But you know, this is not a major project in my life. But that doesn't mean I don't want to do something with it. So I pick a medium. And maybe it's I post them on Instagram. Or maybe I do a PDF of them. A little tiny project that I can wrap up in an afternoon. It's one medium, and that's all it is. Another project, like Made of Steel, might be in all kinds of media, because to me, it's a major project. So now, all of a sudden, this is a way for me to start thinking about how I strategize what I do productively uh, with not only individual projects, but think about your career in this regard. It's not just that you're making pictures but that you're making things, projects, things that have a beginning, middle, and end, that have a set of prints together. And some of those are going to be big projects, and some of those are going to be little projects, and it completely changes the way you think. As a matter of fact, what I've discovered, much to my surprise, this was totally unexpected, was this kind of thinking uh, ratcheted up my productivity tremendously. Somehow, having to think in terms of big projects for everything I wanted to do tended to make me not want to do some things because they weren't worth making giant projects out of. But now that I had the option of making little projects out of things, little PDFs, all of a sudden I became way more productive. I became way more willing to adapt a project to one medium or another, to one audience or another, to one edition or another. With that came another thoroughly unexpected implication. And that is um, that I realized what I was doing when you get right down to it, was more than just images. And to me, this was the earth-shaking thing in my creative life. Prior to this, I defined myself as a photographer, a particular kind of photographer, gel and silver photographer, etc. cetera. Um, but once I started thinking along this train, I realized that a project was more than just a collection of images. It was some kind of statement that I was trying to make to the world. I wanted to, to show something, to demonstrate something, to educate, to inform, to capture something or other. And that led me to the realization that I was not strictly limited to images, that sometimes what I wanted to do was an idea. I'll never forget a portfolio review I did with Ted Orland. Do you know the name Ted Orland? He was one of Ansel Adams' darkroom assistants. And he's 
Uh, he wrote a wonderful book called Art and Fear with, with David Bales that I talked about yesterday. Ted was doing a portfolio review of my work. And I was young at the time, fairly new, and I had a stack of prints. And Ted says, you know, wh what do you have to, to look at here? Let, let's talk about your work. And I said, fine. He said, show me the first piece. And I brought up the first piece, and I set it out for him to see. And then I started telling him about the work. And 20 minutes later, I took a breath. And Ted said, you know, is it my turn to talk yet? <laughs> I said, uh, yeah, I'm just a little nervous. You know, I never had a portfolio review. And he said, well, basically, I guess what I could advise to you is this, that photography is a poor medium for philosophy. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I think you're right. But we had a long conversation about that, and Ted explained to me in uh, no, un they, they were unflinching terms. He was committed to this. He said, you know, the problem is some photographers just want to show the world. That's all they want to do. And an image is perfect for that, because that's what it does. It shows the world. Some photographers want to say something about the world. And if you want to say something about the world, you shouldn't be afraid to go outside the camera and maybe think about text. Well, I had learned, as I'm sure many of you had learned, that any photograph that needs text needs to be a better photograph, which is probably spectacular advice for beginning photographers who uh, sometimes will rely on words to make up for a bad photograph. But that's not what we were talking about. What Ted was saying is sometimes ideas simply cannot be expressed visually. They have to have words to go with them. Once I let that into my consciousness, I realized that I was no longer strictly a photographer. I could be if I wanted to for any given project. But I was able to expand that definition and consider myself a storyteller. And in particular with that Made of Steel project that I showed earlier. Once I started thinking about text with images, it opened up what I was doing. I realized that photography has tremendous virtues and some serious limitations. Text has some tremendous virtues and some serious limitations. But you put the two together, and all of a sudden, something interesting happens. Now keep in mind, this may not be wall art, but my greasy tool, tools and machine shop guys weren't wall art anyway. But look what happens when you combine text. This one I talked about yesterday, the metal scrap salvager. He rolled a cigarette, spit, swore, and asked me if I wanted some tea. See? And now all of a sudden we know something about this guy that we didn't know before. This one, um, it was a present, this is a shop apron, work apron. It was a present from his wife. Um, she had fits getting the grease out of his overalls. She died in 1949. I made this photograph in 1989. The apron is still hanging in his shop. That tells us something about him about his wife, about their relationship. This is man with a new cowboy hat. He couldn't hear a thing, but when I motioned that I wanted to photograph him, he pointed to his new hat and smiled. <laughs> you see, that little bit of text, doesn't, you don't have to write an essay, you don't have to you know, uh, overburden it with text, but text allows you to do something. It allows you to introduce motion and movement and life in ways that a straight portrait can't. Well, now all of a sudden, sorry, I'm going to flip all the way back to here. When you start examining these various media, you realize a whole bunch of them are ideal for text. You can combine images and text to tell stories, to create moods, to introduce language. 
You can even, if you want to, go beyond your own native language and start to introduce translations into your work and suddenly open it up to a worldwide audience. All of this comes because we're thinking beyond just the image. The large and small project thing, I, I cannot overemphasize that enough. When, um, when most of us pick up the camera, what we start to do is look for individual images. Uh, most of photography is driven by the individual image. But there's an interesting question about that. You have your camera. You're out for a day of photography. You're walking around wherever you're driving around. Think of all the things you walk past or drive past that you don't stop and photograph. Why don't you stop and photograph those things? For some reason, they didn't interest you. But then all of a sudden, something does interest you, and you stop and photograph it. Why? Why did that thing, whatever it was that you photographed, interest you? A lot of times, that thing interests you because it's photogenic, right? You can make a good photograph of it. How do we know that? Maybe it's because we've seen someone else do it. So the first thing we have to do as photographers is sort of work through all uh, the cliches. A friend of mine calls these the compulsories. You know? We have to go do all those images that we've been taught to see as photographs. It's a lot of fun to collect our own little personal gallery of great photographic things. But at some point in time, You've sort of gathered all those things that you can possibly want to gather. And you then face the great issue of, what do I do next? The trick, I think, to overcoming that, what do I do next, is to go back and look in your catalog. How many of you are using Lightroom? Yeah, but This is so easy to do in Lightroom. Uh, because, or Bridge, as far as that goes. You can do it in Bridge, too. Is to go back and start looking for the odd ducks. Maureen has a wonderful way of putting this. Imagine you're looking through a set of images that sometimes it'll be teacup, 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 plate. <laughs> you know, it's, still, it's still dinnerware, but it doesn't fit, does it? One of these things doesn't fit. Look at the ones that don't fit. We all have them. Look at all the images that don't fit what you've normally done. Uh, a lot of times you'll find that these images, you don't even remember photographing them, but you did. Have you ever had that experience when you get back and you say, I don't, I don't even remember this. I, I don't remember photographing this, but you did it. So why did you photograph that item? Maybe it's because it bubbled up from deep within you, from your subconscious somehow, your creative muse. I don't want to get too woo-woo on you, but, <laughs> but you get the idea. So, something inside of you said, hey, let's photograph that, and you did it. By the way, I often find I make these images when I'm really tired at the end of the day because I'm so tired I'm, you know, I'm just reacting to the world now instead of uh, thinking about it too much. Th those are always good places to look for where the new idea might come. And take those and then start pushing them. And they'll start as small projects. They all start as small projects. From one image to two images to three images. Sometimes you won't discover those for a long time because they're buried. They're invisible. But again, for those of you who are using Lightroom or Bridge, um, are you diligently doing your keywording? <laughs> This is one of the reasons why you should do keywording as, at least as much as you can, because you'll discover some of the most amazing things. I had no idea I was interested in photographing chairs until Lightroom showed me I had like 900 photographs of chairs. There they were. And when I looked at them, I thought, oh, this must mean something to me. And I realized a lot of them were stupid, and then I realized a few of them were good. And it became a small project. And the small project developed into a big project, etc. 
the photographic life tends by the nature of life itself to be a little bit herky-jerky. We, we photograph while we're on vacation, and we don't photograph for the rest of the year because we're busy working. Or we photograph on the weekend, but then we don't photograph in the week because we're working or whatever the case may be. So it's filled with starts and stops. One of the things I'm suggesting is by dividing your life into large projects and small projects, you can start to smooth some of that out and your creative life will become more and more integrated with your everyday life and when it does so you'll find your creativity goes through the roof. Does this make sense? All of this is the result of the spectrum. Here's the scary part is that it's pretty hard to learn photography. It's, it's complex. There's you know technical gadgetry, lots of stuff to learn, composition, uh, exposure, all of that kind of business. What I've just done, flipping backwards again, what I've just done is given you a whole new set of technological challenges. If you want to learn to do an iPad app, you know, that's, that's going to take some learning curve. But I don't recall anybody ever saying that art uh, learning stops ever. And this really is a way to think about technology and media and production and whatnot in a way that fuels creativity instead of getting in the way. That's what we really want. And once you learn how to do one of these new things, what you'll find is it really does open up your creative life. Does this make sense? You're not going to do every project in every medium but you'll do some in multiple media. And with that, you'll find multiple audiences. One of the things that I've discovered uh, here in just the last few years is how mutually exclusive these audiences are. We have subscribers to Lenswork who say, oh, I'll n I would never look at your tablet version because I want ink. I love the smell of ink. And we say, good, because we like the smell of ink too. But some people say, oh, I can't, I, I can't do the print version because I just don't have any place to store things. You know, my bookshelves are all full and I don't want to have to burden myself with molecules, etc. So thanks for the tablet. Two completely different audiences. But the minute we allow ourselves to think about images rather than prints, about media, plural, rather than medium, how we define ourselves, it does open the door. My experience is most people still have uh, one predominant medium that is their, the love of their life. It's the one they do mostly. But the photographers I know who have embraced this kind of philosophy of the spectrum find their creativity improves, their audience improves, their flexibility improves, their productivity improves. They find themselves more engaged with photography. And isn't that what we're all here to do? is to engage photography even more, make better pictures, make more successful pictures, connect with people more successfully. So that's part of the reason why I say this is the best time ever in the history of photography. We not only have all the previous media, but today's media too that we can produce. So now the question is, how does this fit into your philosophy? That's where this comes in. Take this home, take a look, study it, think about what you produce, how you produce it, who you want it to appeal to, and it'll open up doors. Thank you. Thank you.